Hi, Eric. Thanks for speaking with me today. Of course. So this is uh, kind of an unusual show for me, and this is the first episode of your podcast. Mm -hmm. And um, so you and I met a couple of years ago now at the Monastic Academy, and we did, I think it was the Biomotive Retreat together. Is that right? Yeah. So you were there and we were practicing biomotive and then we did a little circling together and like got to know each other like a little bit. We were friendly, but not, not especially close, I'd say, but like, mm -hmm. you know, friendly is my memory of it. And uh, I don't think we've talked since then, but then a couple of weeks ago, our mutual friend Malcolm reached out to me and said, Eric is starting a podcast where he gets interviewed by people and tries to hold his first person perspective because that's a growth edge for him. Mm -hmm. And we were wondering if you would interview him and it could be on both of your podcasts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you think about that? And I was like, well, that sounds interesting. Uh, be fun to hang out with Eric and give this thing a try. Uh, does that all sound accurate to your memory or what's going uh, on? Pretty here? much. Pretty um, much. The other bit of context to know is uh, Malcolm is staying at my house. He's currently, you know, some number of feet that way. Uh, and gotcha. so that's part of how the plotting happened. Um, and uh, I, the funny thing about the biomotive retreat is it was actually exactly two years ago um, if we, you know, on the calendar. So it's an interesting timing for this to be happening, I think. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, so maybe tell me a little bit about, we'll see where this goes, but I'd be curious mm -hmm. to hear, it's such an unusual frame for a podcast to be, you know, sort of repeatedly interviewed by people or repeatedly interacting with people. What, what, what makes that a project worth pursuing for you? And, and why is like holding your own first person perspective, a, a growth edge for you? The first person perspective thing is another thing that also came from the biomotive workshop. Mm. Um, I don't know if you remember Malcolm and I's uh, dynamic there, but that was uh, even for us discovering how we could uh, work together uh, in conversations. Um, and it was there that it was discovered that I'm very good at having a second person perspective, uh, you know, figuring out what's going on for someone else and like inhabiting it a little bit. And that I, yeah, I basically don't have my own, I don't by default sit in my own first person perspective as much. And uh, that is still, you know, a growth edge two years later. Uh, part of the other reason for the podcast being interviewing me is it who uh, I talk to changes a lot what I you know what I say I have, have an interesting mirror quality to me so in some sense I'm the one being interviewed but I find that uh, you know I'll say very different things or like I'll have very different frames depending on who I'm talking to um, that's that's basically the idea behind the podcast and mm. Uh, one part of the podcast is it is a inter dash view in that like the way I tend to talk uh, is sort of a mutual interview almost. And that is also why it like might go on your podcast as well. Hmm. Hmm. Fascinating. Fascinating. What, what are you uh, sort of feeling emotionally right now as we sort of enter this conversation? Hmm. Um, well, we talked a bit before the call. And so I had, you know, I had a sense to like vibe a little bit. Um, I was, I was feeling a bit nervous then. And then now I'm feeling more like grounded and like, okay, now I get to like do the show thing, uh, that uh, I'm here to do. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm feeling excited. Um, I notice, yeah, like energy, energy in my chest and like in my arms and I want to move more. Hmm. Hmm. What's your sense of me from a second person perspective right now? Ah, ha, ha, ha. 
Yes, very good question. Um, well, so th that's like, how do I remember you? Um, mm. Your your summary was pretty good, but you know, it was from from your perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. So I'll start with like I remember you know you being at uh, the at uh, the monastic academy and uh, being part of the uh, double circle conversation where we had a giant circle of like figuring out how to have a conversation that we wanted that included having a smaller circle in it. And I like I, I remember that you were part of that conversation and that was. That was a very formative conversation in there, um, and but you know it was kind of as you said I, I didn't I didn't particularly talk to you, and uh, so I didn't have you know totally a great sense of who you, who you were personally, but I did have you know a friendliness. You were part of the whole thing, and then um, we I also saw that you were on. Uh, Slack that I am a part of, and I was like, "Is that is that the same? It's the same guy, I think. Uh, it looks a little different now, you know, his hair." <laughs> um, so I didn't recognize you immediately, and so I was like, "Ah, oh, who's this like cool guy? He has a similar name to someone else." Oh wait, no, it's the same guy. Yeah, and I've. So I have these like sort of two impressions of you. One of you like on the Slack and you on Twitter as well. Um, mm -hmm. More recently, uh, as mm -hmm. I've been getting myself into Twitter, um, and this like impression of you at uh, the Monastic Academy that I have yet to like totally put into one person. Mm -hmm. uh, that's more my first person perspective of the whole thing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I have a great second person perspective on you currently actually uh and uh because i don't know you that well mm -hmm. that makes Personally, sense anyway yeah that brings up for me like something else i want to toss in which is mm -hmm. um i so i spend quite a bit of time on twitter these days love twitter and i think i'm very fascinated by the social dynamics that arise in online communities like twitter or the slack that we're in um, where there's sort of like some of the elements are the same as in any social environment, but some are like radically different just because of the sort of affordances of whatever the technology are that the mm -hmm. communication is happening through. And there's a very interesting dynamic that I notice in our connection on Twitter where uh, I haven't been following you, but I've seen you around and mm. There's a specific like relationship to that I have to that, which is like, I want to follow you, but I like, it's all, it almost is like, I want you to earn it. I want you to like ah. show up in a way that it's like, yes, I should be following you. It's like, I, or another way to put it would be, I expect that like at some point in the future, probably right after this conversation, <laughs> I'll be following you because I'll have like enough rapport and context to be like, yes, this makes sense to have mm -hmm. that kind of relationship, uh, which is different, I think, than any other kind of interaction socially that I've seen elsewhere. Um, and I'm curious, like, how, how does that make you feel when I like voice that or surface that? Uh, well, I'm, I'm curious if that's uh, a general pattern on Twitter for you. Is that what you're saying? Or is this something that's specific to me? Mm, it happens. It happens on Twitter uh somewhat frequently i'd say there's like five or ten people like that that i know of right now that i have that ah. sort of feeling like it's like it's like it's like i know i will follow you in the future when i have more context for why i should be following you <laughs> if that makes sense yeah that makes sense yeah uh, I, I think i have the same relationship to some people um I, I probably err more on the side of like, oh, this is a person I know. I'm just going to follow them. Yeah. Um, and like, maybe I'll unfollow them if I find their tweets annoying. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, as far as, you know, what, what comes up for me when you say that, it's very, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I am not a big Twitter user. At least I don't 
compose a lot of tweets. There's a reason why my current, you know, project thing is, you know, X out of a hundred tweets. Cause I'm like, well, I got to tweet something in order to like exist on this platform to have a presence of any kind. Um, and it's, it's something that's uh, very different than in real life spaces where when you're present, like you don't have to say anything to be like known to exist and to be there. And that's something that I have leaned on a lot that I have a much harder time doing online. Like how do you be present without having to like blast everyone with something you're saying? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, that, during this pandemic, that's something I've really struggled with. Um, and it was, uh, it was something I also felt like in contrast, uh, the biomotive retreat, uh, was a place where I felt like I could do that a lot and actually be seen in that because there's, a, there's another thing that can happen sometimes where I'm present, but like, there's too many people just blasting their own whatever. And so like, no one really cares that I'm there. Hmm. Hmm. How many tweets have you written towards this hundred tweet goal? I, I think I'm at seventeen currently. 17. What's that been like so far? Um, I've been holding it very lightly. It's it's almost like I'm just tracking more so, um, and just uh, yeah, just tracking how many tweets I'm tweeting with like you know a light intention, an inclination towards tweeting something if I have a thought that seems like you know tweet compatible or whatnot. Uh, part of this is also just hanging around Malcolm, who's pretty prolific on Twitter and um, having being around someone who has, you know, a tendency to just like tweet something uh, when I'm around them sometimes and like learning what that's like. Hmm. I would say Twitter is interestingly like now my main intellectual community, though, uh, in a way where it used to be more Facebook. What's the difference there for you? There are no dancers on Twitter, or at least I'm not really connected to my dance community on Twitter. Uh, I'm sure they exist, but like my Twitter follow it, follower Twitter sphere is like, you know, it's the, the in-group sphere that um, I, I think I've been part of for a very long time, at least like that's, that's the like who I'm following. Um, but on Facebook, it's a lot of dancing, which is, you know, the other part of my life that is very important, but it's not intellectually stimulating the same way. It's not about, you know, what's happening in society. How do we think? What do we do with emotions? How do we create relationships that last? It's, uh, it's a whole different scene. Can you tell me more about your relationship to dance and why that's important to you? And yeah, that whole area of your life. Oh yeah. So this is one of the things I thought we might get to. Um, dancing is, I've been doing partner dancing West Coast Swing for 10 years now. And it has been my main form of embodiment and expression and uh, in-person community in Vancouver where I live. Um, the, how I started doing that is also an interesting story. I made a spreadsheet of all the different physical activities I could think of that would be like worth my time and, you know, had a bunch of categories in the spreadsheet, um, that mostly weren't actually about, you know, physical activity. They were like, is there, is there a community? Um, would I be building a skill? Uh, is it competitive? Um, you know, does it, is it actually physically active enough? Um, stuff like that. And so I had, you know, like team sports, I had weightlifting, I had, uh, just running, I had partner dancing, I had solo dancing. Um, but partner dancing is the thing that came out on top as like the best physical activity I could be doing. And the only one that really won in a significant way other than that was weightlifting. Um, just because partner dancing doesn't build muscle the same way. Weightlifting is just like, you know, straightforward way to do that. So, 
So I signed up for dancing lessons and then kind of the rest is history. Um, I have, well, well, there's, there's more to that. Here I am with my first person perspective. Um, the, the other big thing I did was apply everything I know about learning and, uh, I mean, basically learning and feedback loops and, uh, you know, creating lesson plans and all sorts of things to like actually get really good at West Coast Swing. And this was like my test ground, my uh, development. Yeah, test ground is good. Uh, experimental ground of how, like, if I know anything, I should be able to apply it somewhere. This is the object level case. And so I did. And uh, I started filming myself a bunch, all my dancing starting in 2014, uh, when I decided to get serious about this. And three years later, I am in the like basically top semi-pro rank in West Coast Swing. Uh, I went from novice to all-star, and I'm like, well, I guess that's that, that's proven I can like do a thing here pretty significantly. And yeah. I had a lot of fun doing that. I did a whole routine, um, and I like started learning how to teach it, which was you know also in line with my interests around learning and now I'm sitting with a sense of like, well, I'm not really sure what to do with having done as much dancing as I have and built building the social connections I have in the dance community. Um, like where, where does, where does this dance fit into my life? If it's not quite as intellectually stimulating, um, but it's like still clearly my favorite thing to do in an embodied sense. Uh, especially since it's like kind of niche. You can't just dance West Coast Swing with, with anybody. It's not an easy to learn dance, unfortunately. Um, and then the pandemic happened, so we can't dance anyway, so I haven't had to. Uh, but I've been, I've been missing it, um, even though I still don't know what to do with it. Hmm. Do you, um, no, I'm curious about the relationship to intellectual stuff, but let, let's come back to that. Um, how to put this. Do you find yourself wanting to stay with West Coast Swing and get better at it in some way? Or do you, have you considered like totally changing what movement practice you're throwing yourself into? Mm. To do more in West Coast Swing, I would have to put more time into it. Um, or, yeah, like more effort than I want to. I basically have gotten to the point where, uh, for my skill level, I, I have to be doing it a certain amount for it to make sense, uh, which means going to conventions or teaching probably. And I'm not actually that interested in doing a lot of teaching in West Coast Swing. Um, it has mostly given me the opportunity to go places and uh, run classes um, in other places. I most recently did this in Japan, which was wow. super fun. Um, <laughs> but it's like not something I want to be doing uh, mainly professionally. Um, so I, I also have stopped going to as many conventions prior to the pandemic anyway. And yeah, the, like the real problem is just like, I have to be doing it a certain amount for it to make sense. And I like, it's really hard to do it at only a medium amount. I forget what your other question was, uh, something about, have you considered, uh, throwing yourself into a totally different movement practice or even a different dance style right. or anything like that? Um, well, so part of my getting better at dancing has just been uh, going to other dance styles. So like I have also done a fair bit of Zouk and blues and some tango, and they've all helped my West Coast swing. Um, uh, and I've gone to a lot of fusion events, which are, you know, 
take any dance style you want and dance with other people who have a bunch of different dance styles. Some of them you don't have. And so you've got to find a common language. That's, that's always an interesting challenge. Um, but those are all still partner dancing and still kind of basically the same thing. Um, solo dancing has a bunch of different constraints. Um, it's, you know, not as social, uh, but you can do it anytime if you have enough space. Uh, like I, I definitely have enough space here to be doing it. Uh, but I, I think I tend to be social. I, I much prefer the social aspect of uh, partner dancing than the solo stuff. And th this is probably related to the whole second person, first person perspective thing where I, I have a hard time finding like my inner voice, you could say. Hmm. So partner and, dance is especially useful for you because it's like a dialogue with someone else. Is, is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I really like conversations like this one, um, you know, uh, dancing with someone in West Coast Wing in particular feels a lot like a conversation. And uh, it's a way of like framing my thoughts I, or constraining my thoughts, you know, a creative constraint in some sense where I like know who I'm speaking to um, and I have enough context to frame my thoughts and like then deliver them in words. Um, and this is part of what's been hard about Twitter is it's like, who am I talking to? Just the void. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of my tweets have come up as, you know, responses to, or uh, something that was in conversation, uh, usually with Malcolm, but you know, other people as well sometimes. Yeah, maybe it's helpful to reveal uh, what, like part of my curiosity around dance in case just like throw that into the uh -huh. conversation. Cool. Um, uh, well, one, I'm generally interested in movement practices quite a bit. Uh, it's been a big part of my own journey is like getting embodied and trying different things and seeing how they fit together. And um, I'd say I have like two main goals with my own movement practice right now. Uh, one is to learn... I'm focusing this year on learning the the Sun Tai Chi form, which will take like something like six to nine months to get just the basics down, uh, and then I'll be practicing that for the rest of my life probably. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I'm also really trying to throw myself into dance um, more, like improvisational, solo. But I mean, I could dance with someone else, but just like very freestyle, no form dancing, uh, but but my goal there is not so much to match a certain style as to integrate the different contemplative practices that I've done into the way that I'm mm -hmm. dancing. So the simplest mm -hmm. example, it's just the simplest example, but the simplest example is um, doing loving kindness meta practice while I dance uh, that I'm like, I like visualize directing love towards people and, and using my body to, uh, send love towards people and and maintaining like a state of love and friendliness while I dance. And uh, yeah. Um, and then th those are also blending together. Like I am exploring integrating the Tai Chi into the dance and a little bit of the dance into the Tai Chi and like blending them and seeing how they converse with each other. Uh, and so it's, it's always interesting to me to hear about people's movement practices, because even if I'm not doing the same form as them, like, there's such an interesting, oh, well, one, it inspires me, but also like uh, gives me ideas and helps me make sense intellectually of what's happening. So it's mm -hmm. nice to hear about your experience, like with partner dancing and why that's important to you. And um, I'm curious if hearing like my, about why I'm interested brings anything up for you. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious if you are, you're someone who identifies as like mostly having been in your mind or is that like a theme in your life? To some extent, I'd say I was pretty sedentary until really until I started training in a monastery. I, I did a little bit of soccer as a kid and then I like did not want to do team sports in high school. So I had to go to gym class instead of doing team sports and, um, and in college, I did a little bit of this and that, but basically was pretty sedentary and just focused on my studies. And then when I started doing monastic training, I was 
required to exercise every day for an hour. And that, you know, years of that basically made, made me an embodied person. And, and of course, meditation practice, um, this is not as commonly known as it should be, but like ideally meditation practice is really something that you do with your body, uh, not your head or just your head or whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, it's about the breathing and the body and relaxation and, you know, at least certain styles of meditation, some styles of the meditation definitely involve the mind, but, um, yeah. So I'd say there has been a transition from like an intellectual sedentary person to, you know, an embodied, uh, human animal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Uh, part of why I decided to do one of the things in the spreadsheet of, uh, the different physical activities, I was trying to figure out what to do. Uh, one of the categories was like, how unusual would it be for me to be doing this? Um, and at the time, definitely dancing, uh, had like a, um, an, an expression, uh, being expressive and, uh, it's vaguely associated with being more feminine and uh, something that I was like not at the time. I, w- I was also like, you know, very nerdy into computers. I mean, I still am, but uh, this has been a whole area added to my life where I can feel embodied. Um, and it like turns out I've always been like secretly quite embodied. I just like didn't really think of myself that way until I started dancing. Um, and I mean, at the same time, I'm also very happy to uh, be, act, or uh, inhabit the feminine much more than I used to uh, in like, you know, non-obvious motherly ways or even just, you know, in my dancing, just being like a little, you know. Um, and I also follow and dance. Uh, it's important for teaching and learning uh, to be able to lead and follow, um, which is a whole other aspect of that. Hmm. If you had to totally switch your movement practice from West Coast swing or even partner dance entirely and do something completely different, what would you do? I mean, the thing I've been wanting to get back into is weightlifting. I did do that for about a year and then I stopped. Um, and that's, that's pretty different. Um, I have also been thinking of doing something like karate, except I would probably, it probably wouldn't be karate. It would be, I don't know. I would have to find something that philosophically lines up a lot better than the karate I ever have experienced. Um, but I have, I've seen possibilities out there and uh but i haven't explored too much in that what would be attractive to you about uh some kind of martial art that was compatible with your philosophy uh martial arts is also somewhat community based you know you go to a dojo and you practice and so you can like build connections there um and a lot of it is about you know, working with energy pretty much. And uh, dance is also about working with energy, but no one really talks in those terms in partner dance anyway. Uh, solo dance, they might more. And I I have a hypothesis that I'm working with a lot of repressed anger um, that I have yet to really access a lot of. And that seems like it. Like that or weightlifting seems like it would be a good medium for that. Um, And this ties back to your comment about uh, embodied practices being something that you can also practice meditation while doing, Um, especially if you subscribe to the uh, Mark school of thought around meditation, where meditation can be (laughs) all sorts of things. Mm. And like there's a very important way in my experience with weightlifting that it is there's a lot of like what is happening in your mind how are you approaching the like lifts um what is you know what's happening in your body the whole there's a whole lot of things that go into just how much can you lift and i've i found like you know there's times where i just like can't 
lift any more than I used to over a period of weeks, uh, simply because of, you know, all sorts of weird things happening in my body, mind, and like not feeling, uh, you know, like I can lift more. Um, but then at other times it's very clearly like, I, I feel like, you know, I lift a thing. I'm like, oh, that was hard, but I could do more than that. You know, I, I can feel that I could do more. Um, and there's more like energy to that's able to flow to to lift more. Um, and that's that's like a very clear benchmark sort of situation in weightlifting. Uh, in in dance, there's a very in partner dance in particular, there's a very uh, different kind of attuning to the other person and figuring out what wavelength they're on and seeing what way you can nudge that. Um, because a lot of the dancing as I do it now is it's all automatic. Like I can do all sorts of, you know, moves and patterns and stuff, and I don't have to think about staying on time or anything. So most of my attention is just sort of what's happening in the music and then how's my partner doing and what are they, what do they want to express? And there's, there's something meditation flavored about that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me more about your experience of energy in dance? Energy, energy. It's like, ooh. On a, on a very basic level for West Coast Swing in particular, you're working, uh, the, the, part of the model is that is, it's basically a physics model. Um, it's not entirely accurate, but like followers have a certain amount of momentum um, and, you know, they're not supposed to be doing uh, things that they're, they're not supposed to be moving if they haven't been like caused to move. So it's, it's not a signals uh, where you like, I give you this signal and then you like do this move. It's very much like I'm going to cause as the leader, I'm going to cause my follower to go here by exerting force. And then they have to have, you know, a frame that like lets you do that. Um, so in, in a, a very uh, this scientific sense. It's just, it's more science flavored because it's not exactly how it works. Um, but in a very scientific sense, there's force energy involved. Um, but then there's the experience of causing that kind of force and like your own momentum and how you want to direct that force. That, that it just feels like it's you know running throughout your your body and is also part of expressing the music like i feel like the music it like it gets inside me and then i have to express it somehow in my body and that like the energy i i'm like thinking about okay where's where's the energy in my body where's the energy in the song where's the energy between the two of us am i the one who's like the focus right now are they the focus um Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Does that feel That's like an answer to your question? <laughs> it does, definitely. I, I think I'm just like digesting that because there's a lot there. And um, can you say I'm I'm not sure how much I'll understand this, but I am very curious to ask to come back to how the other forms of dance that you've tried impacted or benefited your West Coast swing mm. practice. Yeah, so the other styles I've done uh, done an amount of that I think would be significant. I have like tried many, many styles, but I've only ever done uh, Zouk, Tango, uh, Blues, and Fusion significantly. Um, I would say, like one, one very basic thing is just I can incorporate moves from other dances into West Coast Swing. West Coast Swing is a very flexible dance. Um, there's a lot of patterns, but the patterns are just composed of, you know, smaller chunks, pretty much. And you can switch out the chunks with all sorts of different things. Um, and West Coast Swing in particular has borrowed a lot from other dances. So it's, uh, 
it's all it's a constantly evolving form of dance unlike other ones which have been you know crystallized or reified in certain ways so over the years it's got an influence from uh hustle uh carolina shag um disco uh and now zook is kind of the latest one and this also changes with how the uh what music is played so you know pe- more lately people have been playing slower songs and fusion and blues tend to be really slow uh much slower than west coast swing normally and so it's like you can take these elements from these other dances um, and be like ah oh, we're going to dance to a really slow song i can take this thing that i know about from blues and put this in to my dance um and it goes the other way around. Um, I've never done ballroom, but whenever I go to a fusion thing, I, I tend to be pretty framey. And people always interpret this as I've done ballroom. And it's like, no, I've done just West Coast Swing. But like that incorporates a lot of other dances. So I can see why you might think that. Um, Zook in particular has a flowy quality to it that West Coast Swing doesn't normally have. Um, and so there's a lot of that flavor I can bring into West Coast Swing as well, and even put in very like cheeky uh, Zook moves in. Um, some people have been combining the styles and calling it Swook, and so they'll play things that you can dance either Zook or West Coast Swing to, or mix it all up. Wow, wow, that's really cool to hear. Huh. It sounds like some of the value uh, for you and having an embodiment practices around relation to others. And I'm curious how you would describe beyond that, what, what the value of having an embodiment practice is for you. Hmm. I, I notice that I notice I exist much more, um, to the extent that I, have been in my body it's like i feel like i've been in contact with reality more i have a sense of you know what's possible i i also like want to be physically adept at things um that seems pretty important like there's this you know this image of some old person who's you know hunched over and like can't really do a lot of things and i've seen the the the, the decline of uh, my parents health uh where they don't do a lot of um embodied things my dad takes walks which is pretty good uh he's he's doing pretty good but he he like can't he's not alive in the same way and it seems important to me if you're alive to be like actually really alive um and that's just a lot of fun and great um I also want to look good. Uh that that gets back to the social stuff. Um but th- there is a bit of that like who am I to myself even mm-hmm. in there. Mm-hmm. That all makes sense. That all makes sense. I love how you put those things because I've certainly thought and or valued the same things myself, but I like how you describe them. One other thought. Um, Mm -hmm. Embodiment does help with thinking. Um, The amount of times I've had dance metaphors come up for some way that I've been wanting to express something, I think uh, it's it's a lot. I mean, not just because it's a huge part of my life, but I think even the way I think, uh, it does not start as words. It starts as emotion, a feeling, a relationship, some kind of proprioceptive something. And I'm like, "These, these two things have this kind of relationship or something um and it's it's a very feels very physical embodied in my brain how i think about it Mm, fascinating fascinating um what would you say the value of intellectual activity or an intellectual practice is in the same way that we just talked about the value of Embodiment. 
I mean, there's a lot of different intellectual practice type of things out there. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a bit, that's a big question, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm maybe sure let's know. start with this then. Uh, what what are some intellectual activities that you find yourself engaging in these days? Um, I will, I'll maybe answer somewhere in between those two. Okay, uh, great, um, perfect. I I, I think. The, you know, the big question that I think is largely, it has to involve the intellectual is like, what are you doing? What do you think you're doing? Uh, why? You know, very big questions um, that you like necessarily have to engage with intellectually, I think. Um, and, you know, there's there's many other dimensions to this. Okay, like, you know, what are you doing with a who? Um what is their sense of what you're doing and what they're doing? Um, and, you know, that gets into like, you know, how do you build a, a community and who are your friends? Uh, which you can probably tell that I, I think a lot about uh, the social aspect of things. Um, and then in order to you know, actually be able to do anything that you want to do. Um, the, there's, the, there's the how of how do you do stuff? Um, and how do you know what you're doing is, is in fact what you think you're doing? Uh, you know, epistemics uh, is, is a pretty big part of my life. Um, this comes from being part of the rationality scene since 2010-ish. Uh, I went. I went to one of uh, the Center for Applied Rationality's first workshops, and have since been a many-time volunteer. Uh, around seventeen workshops or something, despite not living in the Bay Area. Wow! Wow! Yeah. Well, like I've went to their workshops as a mentor. I should say. I, I don't know if I said that. Um, so, like helping uh, other people go through the workshop and uh, being someone who knows the content. Yeah. Um, th there's another whole realm that's, it feels related, but it's a different angle and it's more related to phenomenology. Like how do we interpret what is happening? Um, how do we make sense of it? Uh, how do we make sense of our own feelings and thoughts even, uh, you know, what's happening in my body? What does this have to do with what's happening out here? Or what do I even perceive? to be happening out there. Uh, what's, what, what is it possible to feel is I think an unusual question that I often ask, um, you know, in contrast to just how am I thinking, how am I feeling about this? Like, how could I be thinking about this? How could I be feeling about this? How does this person think about it or feel about it? You know, um, so perspectives so that's another common thing I think about. Hmm. Speaking of, I, I've been wanting to ask, like, what's your experience in this uh, podcast interview so far? Hmm. Uh, surprise, delight, curiosity, uh, interest. Um, recognition and friendship or brotherhood, I would say. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about brotherhood mm -hmm. in particular. Um, maybe you remember this from Maple, but one of the things that I picked up there is calling people friend. Uh, do you remember that? I, I don't. So this is a Quaker practice uh, from the Society of Friends, and you, uh, in that community, you address people as friend, uh, and it's it's like a spiritual practice. It's a social custom as a spiritual practice, and that has a lot of implications. But um, you try to maintain a friendly attitude towards people and see them as friends, uh, not you know anything else. And I've done that for years, and um, recently have have started 
putting on a similar lens of seeing that it's complicated with like current gender concepts but the simplest (laughs) thing is like seeing men male presenting folks as brothers seeing female presenting folks as sisters and uh there are certain kinds of dynamics that come out there that i think uh can be wholesome and can be cultivated so there's there's you know i don't know what your gender identity is or how you present or what pronouns you like or something, but you sort of present as a man. And I feel like a brotherly energy towards you of like admiration and respect and like peer, like being your peer and um, uh, wanting to learn from you and like play with you and grow with you. And that's, that's the kind of feeling tone of it for me. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Hmm. Is is there something like family in there? Uh, when you say brother and sister, is like f- family part of that? Maybe. Uh, sometimes, but m- more in a universal sense of like we are of the human mm-hmm. family or the planet Earth family or the living beings family and not necessarily like of the same family unit that would have some of the implications of like, if you and I had been literal brothers together or something. Um, But just, just a sense of togetherness or connection or intimacy that might not have like, I think, I think, I mean, I don't know. I'm an only child. So that, that might be part of it for me is like, I never had brothers or sisters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) So there's like a hunger there for, for this kind of connection but i at least from the outside it seems to me like if if i'd had a brother or a sister there would be a lot of like specific social implications or obligations or connotations of that that aren't necessarily what i mean here of like i don't even know what they'd be because <laughs> i'm an only child but i like see that from the outside but but yeah it's, it's just more like it's more like a male form of friendship is, is what i would i mm-hmm. would say yeah I mean, I definitely see that on Twitter, and you seem like you know an amazing, loving presence on Twitter. Uh, extremely friendly. Um, I it, it is interesting how that comes out more on Twitter, or is more evident somehow on Twitter uh, than it was, I guess, at Maple. Uh, I don't know if this is due to some change in temperament, or just like you know the the way you on Twitter can seem to write more of you know just like put your soul out there in a certain way that's not as easy in person not not you in particular uh maybe but uh in general i I think that's a thing i've been thinking a lot about family recently as well um in terms of like what what does the family unit sort of allow you to do what What social technology is that? What is the frame of family and, you know, people you grew up with and are in your life for forever? Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, as an only child, I also have this sense of like, I don't, I don't have, you know, brother or sister, but like, what, what would that be? What, um, what, what does that allow? Um, And to what extent can your family, chosen family, like be in fact, a chosen family. Uh, and th- this relates to a lot of the uh, queer stuff that's been uh, going around lately where, you know, people are, are really choosing their identities. Um, I mean, for the record, I identify as a man. I use uh, he, him. That, that one's not complicated for me. It's sort of bog, standard, boring. Uh, <laughs> uh-huh. Uh, but I have been spending a lot of time like trying to understand uh, and be part of queer culture. Uh, basically, everyone I've ever dated has been queer in s- some mm. respect. And uh, they sometimes mostly found that out after I dated them, which has been an interesting adventure for me and them. Mm. Mm. Fascinating. Fascinating. 
Uh, tell me more about that. What's what's the is that, were you implying that this has happened multiple times? Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I mean, basically, the queer cultures are one of the places where people are asking, you know, what are relationships? Um, what, uh, you know, what is sexual desire? What is romantic desire? How does that look? How does that, you know, actually feel? Uh, in the body, what's possible on these fronts. So, you know, extremely relevant to my interests. Um, and yeah, so anyone I've ever dated, I've sort of asked these questions to them, you know, how do you know you're attracted to me or not? Um, and and not, not, not in a, like an interrogating way, but like, you know, just what, what's your experience of attraction uh, what's your experience of, you know, this person? Are you attracted to them or not? And, you know, th- this dovetails really nicely for me into, uh, like, I also am polyamorous or at least do- uh, I would say more non-monogamous or relationship anarchist or something. I-, I don't view relationships in the standard frames as much. I have a lot of strange relationships uh, from the mainstream view. And-, and part of that has come from asking these, like, weird questions and then uh, ending up with like cuddle buddies as one form of relationship that I've had a lot where that's like as uh, physically intimate as we get. Um, and that's great. I love cuddling. Um, in the same way that like dance, partner dance can be extremely intimate in a lot of ways. Um, and then doesn't necessarily have to go anywhere else. Um, even though in a lot of dancing, you are also working with a lot of sexual energy. Um, this is something that people don't like to talk about very much um, because they they want dance to be a safe place where there is no sexual energy at all. And that make that makes sense given like you know their understanding of uh, you know sexuality and safety. Um, like in order, this is mostly women, but. Uh, I've I've definitely had experiences that I, I felt like I was being you know sexually aggressed upon, um, but I'm not going to kid myself that that compares uh, to how often that happens for w- women or women presenting or followers or however you want to language that. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you know that's an ongoing question of like you know what when you're dancing with someone, what is, what is the kind of energy that's present here to link it back to the other stuff we were talking about? Is there sexual energy here? Is it just, we're playing with sexual energy because this song is very erotic somehow, or it's, um, you know, there's a lot of innuendo in the song or, uh, is, is the song, are we like acting out the song ourselves? Are we like taking on the roles of whatever's happening in the song? Or are we just dancing to the rhythm of the song? Cause we like how it sounds. Um, and that, that's part of the like continually sussing out what's happening with this other person. How are they interpreting the music? Uh, how, what do they want to express even? What do they want to express with me? Um, because, you know, how, who you're dancing with matters a lot as well. And unfortunately, queer representation or these, these sorts of questions they don't come as uh, as easily as I would like to the West Coast swing dance community anyway. Fusion dance community is a bit more on top of this, but like I said before, it's not really an intellectual space the same way. So it's been something I've more been exploring on my own and with close friends. Yeah, I said a lot there. See- Where- what do you see as the cultural difference? Like, what do you notice in the West Coast swing community versus the fusion community that makes the fusion community more on top of this? I'm not sure the origins exactly on this, but West Coast swing has competitions in it and is, uh, you know, it's taught in classes, uh, like normal mainstream classes. Uh, it, West Coast Swing as a egregore uh, is 
trying to be mainstream and presentable and uh, like broadcastable, like put being put on TV. Um, Fusion does not have the same requirements. It's always been more the social dancing aspect of it. Uh, they, they have only recently had competitions, and I, I don't think anyone really cares about them because the diversity in what people are bringing to Fusion is like extremely hard to judge. There's no uh, consistent standards. Uh, not, not that the standards in West Coast Swing are particularly consistent, but at least they're trying in a certain way. Um, not to say Fusion should have standards either. Um, part of what makes Fusion Fusion and as uh, freeform as it is, is that there aren't. Um, Zook is basically the same as West Coast Swing. Um, it comes from Brazil and it's uh, the origins of that are extremely uh, heteronormative, uh, machismo flavored. Um, and the, the only extent that uh, Zook isn't or does something else is usually that it has had contact with the fusion community. Um, so the fusion world is more in contact with these things. Um, but then there's the, the whole other separate thing. I don't think many people in the queer communities are really thinking about things the way that uh, I am with, like they don't take in phenomenology and epistemology nearly as much uh, to the whole thing. It's more social justice flavored these days, which is... Well, it could be better. <laughs> mm -hmm. What are the sorts of conversations or explorations that you're having with the close friends that you have around these issues? A lot of it comes back to community building. And, you know, who do we who do we want in a community? What do we want the vibe of a certain space? to be and you know who's in it and how are they thinking about the space um so a recent conversation i had was about uh switching and who um sw switching in dance so like in the middle of a dance uh starting as a lead and then uh, or a follow and then taking the lead and then having the role switch in the middle of the dance. And that can go, you know, back and forth a bunch. Um, that's really fun. Um, but like it requires both people to be leading and following or be able to do that to a, at a certain skill level for it to actually be fun and invigorating. Um, and there, there's a question of like, you know, should that be uh, normal or expected? Um, or should I'm going to use this word with like at least three levels of quotation marks? Should uh, people be uh, expected to be able to switch, or like is it uh, fine for people to only want to do you know one one kind of role? And if we wanted to make a community or a dance event where it was switching heavy, how would we do that? Um, and like, what's behind the psychology of people who are more interested in switching and doing both roles versus the people who want to do only one role? And like one thing that does seem to come up is like the queer dancers are far more likely to be uh, interested in actually dancing both roles and switching. Um, and like the other main avenue through which people become good at this is just like they want to get really good at dancing so they get good at leading and following and then find that they like both things because they're actually good at them um but for people who are more not really thinking too much about what they want or are just fine you know having this social activity uh that they do um they they prefer one role they kind of just do that they don't uh think about it too much and it's like how do we coexist in the same community uh where it's like, you know, cheaper to have a big dance space where we include everybody and not just the like high level people or people who want to um, do both roles. Yeah. 
I'm getting the sense that um, there, there may be specific questions that you want to be exploring through your movement practices and your intellectual endeavors, but also that maybe underneath that, you're longing for community with people who can engage with these questions from both perspectives and a place of familiarity and even expertise and have both stimulating conversations or reflections on these topics, but also like embody them through motion or dance. Does that sound about right to you? That's an amazing summary. <laughs> yeah. That's like you hit the nail on the head. Uh-huh. I imagine that's a tall order, but you when you find it, it's happy. <sighs> yeah. I mean, this comes back to the question of like, you know, what do I want to do? Right. Yes. Um, it is a tall order. Uh, if I, I think if I was doing less, I don't know, I feel like less has already been done in some sense. This is, this what, seems to me like the, uh, has already been done. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just came out of my mouth. Oh, yes, now I have good. to make sense of it. Yes. Excellent. Uh, excellent. We're dancing on this level. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, I guess there's like two angles that I could go with that. Like pe people have done dancing and expressed things in it. People have built grand theories of all sorts of philosophies and uh, what's going on uh, in people's lives. Um, and to some extent, famously, philosophy is very theoretical. And I, I just I just want both, and there's a lot of there's a lot of things to explore in both domains, and you know, cross disciplinary. Um, th there's something about being fully integrated in all of that that I'm I'm looking for, and in in some sense, looking to be integrated with other people about. Um, on whatever level that makes sense. There's something about being integrated with other people that seems cruxy about it. Seems it's really for me. I'm getting this this sense as well that um, might be useful for this of like, j just from the way you describe it, I imagine that when you're in a dance community, both people maybe aren't speaking or reflecting or like writing or talking about issues generally. And then there's also maybe like, social norms about what's okay to talk about or not okay to talk about, or just like common to talk about or not common to talk about that might not include, as you said, like say epistemology or like <laughs> phenomenology or things like that, uh -huh. uh, or, or sexuality or gender dynamics or energy, like we talked about. And then on the other hand um, of when you're say on Twitter or another in online community of uh, it being maybe, maybe you experience that as like, radically disembodied where you don't have a sense of who someone is or how they show up in the world or how they move their bodies or what it's like to literally or metaphorically dance with them. Uh, does that, does that match your experience in physical and online spaces respectively? Uh, I think that people on Twitter are not, uh, totally disembodied. Uh, they are, they are the in group for a reason. Um, but I, I my mean experience that your experience of them, of them is. Yeah. My, my experience is like, I, yeah, I don't know how to connect on this physical level a lot of the time. Cause it is very just, um, th there is a separate thing of like some communities are just very intellectual. The rationalist community being like the sort of famous example of mm -hmm. people who are just in their heads 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's that's a that's a pretty good cross section of the different you know what what each side is sort of missing. Yeah, because I'm I, I mean this is a little bit to zoom in, but one of the things that's happened for me over time on Twitter is getting a sense that like I'm playing a game of my own making and everyone is playing a game of their own making and if you watch how people play their game you learn what the rules are and get a sense of whether you'd like to play and how to play and how to engage Uh and also which games you want to play and that's not unlike dancing of like they're very different games you know like a simple one is like flirting right like this person likes to flirt and yeah, they're attractive to me. And here we go. <laughs> We're going to flirt now. And even the ways that they flirt are different for different people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a very simple example. But other people have very complex or involved or evolving games. And uh, it requires like the same kind of attention that, that you were describing with dance of, of like watching the other person and seeing what it's like to be the, and how can I shift them slightly. And, uh, and, and also a sense of your own game as it were and what it is that you're trying to do and where that intersects and of course some people you you you're like oh i don't even want to play that game like uh for whatever reason but but a lot of times there's really interesting overlaps of how your game fits into other people's games and i i imagine from this conversation that that could be a kind of growth edge for you on twitter at least of of like discerning what people's games are and then learning to dance with them in the same way that metaphorically of course that that you do literally in West Coast Swing. Uh, yeah, definitely on Twitter. That's part of it. I have a vague sense of some people's games. Some people are more overt about it, of uh-huh. course. Uh, some people are, you know, famously illegible. Uh-huh. So, and, yeah. and and sometimes that's their game. Is like, uh, how illegible can I be while still like, you know, conveying any information at all? Uh-huh. Uh, I think in some ways, Mark plays this game. Uh, and I find it's a fun game. I really like that game. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I, I do this myself a little bit, so that's you know that's why I like that one. Uh, I'm really glad you brought up games, even as a metaphor. This is something I have been uh, exploring recently as well. Of you know the the infinite game, mm-hmm. and. What sort of mini games within the infinite game are fun to play, and which mm-hmm. ones are just like pff, not worth my time? Yeah, it makes me want to, uh, like, give you the opportunity to practice because, like, with me, uh, because I imagine that would be very interesting. I, I don't think I've consciously fully articulated what my own game is i do have a a strong sense of it because i'm playing it constantly but Mm -hmm. i haven't articulated it and i would be curious to hear you say both for me and then also i think this would be interesting practice for you to reflect what you what you what game you see me playing from what from Mm -hmm. what you can tell yes uh from what i can tell there's a like I mean, there's some part of loving kindness game in there. Like, how can you, uh, you describe the bit about being friends with everyone or brothers and sisters with everyone or uh, being in touch with love more generally is kind of the game I see putting it is sort of like, how how much can you be really out there with that? Um, that's that's one version of the game. And it, it seems... I don't know. I haven't seen enough of your interactions with other people to see like what games you're playing with other people. But you know, that would be my very basic. Like, this is the game that Tashin's playing, sort of with himself, almost. Not even mm-hmm. like it includes other people, but it's it seems like a. I imagine it's a it's a self challenge of some kind. Mm-hmm. Fascinating, fascinating. I, I think that's definitely a big part of it. I think uh, another part would be. Twitter has been exceptionally good for discerning, noticing, and working through various limiting beliefs or opportunities for growth of, um, oh, I noticed this kind of social interaction is hard for me, or, or just unfamiliar or uncomfortable. Can I dive into that? And 
So that's one of like, if I notice a limit that I have in my life, I engineer ways to like practice pushing that boundary with Twitter. Uh, and then usually with, you know, usually I like fall on my head a little bit and uh, make some mistakes. And then it's as like, we, as we integrated. do. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and another one I'd say is, um, well, and this of course will be uh, completely illegible to you because uh, you don't have access to it, but I, I have multiple accounts. So I have several alts and each of those have different intentions mm. that are, I'd say are more like, well, each account has sort of different intentions, but those are a lot about, um, uh, testing conceptions of self and ways of speaking and connecting to people that are maybe more intimate or like about biographical content or things like that, or the mm -hmm. narrative that I have about myself um, that, that sort of push the limits of how I conceive of myself and, and how I interact with others. Uh, and then, and then usually that gets integrated into like main, you know, it's like over yeah. time that that folds in and becomes more, uh, more of the holistic picture. Yeah. That seems like a really cool way to be playing games. Uh -huh. I haven't quite yeah. thought of it like that. I, I've had a vague sense of I should have another alt. The only, the only alt I really have is is just a weird son, which I will say I have, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to tell you which one because that's part sure. part of the the game of the weird son. As far as I understand <laughs> it, is is no one knows who any weird son is. Could be anybody. Uh -huh. Um. So, do you find that it's harder to? It, it, like you were talking earlier about how you have this challenge to tweet on your account. Uh, do you tweet frequently on your weird son account or infrequently or what's that? Infrequently. Like for um, infrequently. I, for a while it was like about as much as my main account. Uh -huh. um, now we recently have, there was a, a small blip recently about weird sons again, where I tweeted a bit on then, but then I haven't tweeted since at all. And I've tweeted far more on my main account. I see. It makes me want like, um, if I were in your shoes right now, I would spin up a totally different account in which the focus was like raw volume, like no holds barred. Like I could tweet like one word or like a anything just to get volume out and then like push on volume and see what happened if I did that. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Make a volume up. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> How does that idea land for you? I like I like the metaphor of volume. That seems I didn't. Um, I, I have like you know other things that sort of have similar feelings to them of like you know a brainstorming thing almost where it's like if you thought it you you put it down. That's that's those are the rules. Um, mm -hmm. Making it about volume is, is yeah. It's, there's. There's something also, of course, if it's not tied to your name, there's less like social weight to it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess I haven't quite differentiated something about, um, like I want it, I want credit to go to my name somehow. And if it's an alt, then I don't get that. Um, mm -hmm. then they, you know, puts a bunch of expectations on my like actual named account. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Where are you at now, uh, sort of emotionally and also interpersonally in this conversation? Uh, I found it very useful to say a lot of what I have said in this conversation mm -hmm. ab about where my interests are and, you know, the whole embodied and dance thing. And uh, I have at least uh, the sense that you, from what you've said, you have a pretty good idea of where I'm coming from and uh, what what my interests are, what I'm doing, um, especially, you know, based on the, you know, the recognition and brotherhood and the way you were able to summarize a lot of what I was saying and what I wanted, like very succinctly. Uh, and that feels, I don't know, something like I'm, I'm seen, I do exist, I do have all my uh, thoughts and feelings that I in fact do have. And uh, it is possible to communicate them to other people, which feels good. Uh -huh. um, I, I'm, I'm sitting with a sense of, you know, well, there's some other people are going to be watching this. Uh, I don't know who they are, um, but I'm feeling 
pretty good about uh, I guess how I've represented myself here, and this is this is probably a side of me that a lot of people haven't seen that mm -hmm. uh, you've been able to draw out here. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm sitting with something like mm, potential possibility. Mm -hmm. mm, where does this go? Mm, uh -huh. mm. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Huh. Yeah, yeah, and then I also enjoy uh, the part of the potential is is the this volume alt idea, or like you know what what games are people playing? I'll write that one down too. Mm -hmm. uh, what 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 game do I seem to be playing on Twitter? Uh on Twitter or in life, but maybe maybe on Twitter. Mm -hmm. know, you probably haven't. You you said before you haven't really seen me on Twitter or something. Yeah, I think I'll answer uh, m more the game that I want you to play. Okay. Uh, yes, I want you to bring the level of dedication and skill, and also the specific kinds of skills that you've cultivated in your movement practice to Twitter, and your intellectual practices and your longing for community and see what happens when you do that, when you transpose those skills into a totally different setting that's social and verbal and uh, networked. Uh, mm -hmm. And I want to see what happens as you push the boundaries of that. And I want to see what happens if you play that game with me over time on Twitter. I imagine some really interesting things could come out. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what I'm longing for as this conversation comes to a close is like continued play in exploratory boundary pushing forms that are emergent based on our respective, uh, backgrounds and aspirations. Yeah. Mm hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Mm. Tall order, mm. but I think you can do it. That's that's the little game I'm I'm interested in playing, man. I think it's yeah. appropriate. Yeah, it is a tall order too. Yeah, I well, see I, it I also, in you. I also anticipate having had this conversation that there's some level of that that becomes more available, at least between me and you, and then in the the greater uh, in group zeitgeist. Definitely. I mean, this is this is um I mean even this podcast and the the future ones are also me trying to introduce myself and what I'm about to people like one audience I have in mind is people on Twitter who yes uh follow you and me and we'll see what they what they think of it um and uh, part of the reason Malcolm is the one who brought it up was like he was the one who came up with a podcast idea first uh, mm -hmm. And he's been trying to figure out how to market me in some sense, mm -hmm. how to be the person to be like, hey, this guy. Um, because we've we've had a long relationship. Uh, we've known each other for eight years and um, have I've had a lot of residences on this stuff, but he's been just far more public about a lot of things. And I've been just, you know, a little yeah. eternal. Yeah, that feels important to speak to before we close out. Um, mm -hmm. Could you say both? Well, let's start. Uh, there's two questions I'd like to ask, and we'll see how this goes. But um, what what has your relationship been with him over those eight years? So we met uh, at a party in the Bay Area, a rationalist party, um, and we then were both very early volunteers for the Center for Applied Rationality. Um, in, in one of our first conversations, he talked about the group he was with in Waterloo, uh, which is now known as the Liminal Space Agency. Um, and so I had this sense of like, oh, here's, here's this guy who also lives in Canada, but I'm meeting him here and he has <laughs> an interesting, uh, intellectual community, something about, you know, having cool relationships, which at the time I was also interested in, um, from there, we basically were in a lot of the same spaces, a lot of the same contexts, you know, read the same stuff in the rationalist community. 
we went to Burning Man together uh, uh, in 2014. And then in 2015, we were at different camps, but we still saw each other the, a lot um, there. And there's a bunch of photos on Facebook that include him there. Um, so we, we bonded a lot then. Um, we, we, we have a funny story of both being people who live in Canada, uh, but feel like our heart was in the Bay area for a long time, uh, with the rationalist and the extended community around that. So we, for a long time, we only ever saw each other in the Bay area, despite both living in Canada, uh, basically until 2018, um, uh, and the, and the, like the thing we would do is every summer we would go to the Bay Area and go to all the events there: the EA Summit, the Seafire uh, reunion, the uh, Burning Man, and uh, I would go to a dance event. But he'd go there. Uh, and then in 2018, um, I went to visit him and his crew in Waterloo, which were doing a whole thing around um, how to. I mean, there's a lot of ways to describe the thing that they're doing, but it's like uh, how to do collective intelligence well, how to be in, how does a group get enlightened as opposed to just, you know, some kind of individuals, uh, how do you, what, what are your good relationships, how to, how to relationship, uh, how to think about economics beyond just money in relationship. And the, there was a really weird thing happened there when I went there. Um, what I found was a lot of people thinking in similar ways to how I had been thinking about uh, these sorts of questions. Um, and in particular, I felt like there was a lot of space available there and a lot of perspective taking that I did not find elsewhere before, uh, like that to that extent. Um, and in the background, there was a lot of for, for them, like I felt like I actually connected to people who knew a lot about economics and like parenting and education and uh, how that like actually grounds out somehow in your relationships and reality. And I had a funny experience of connecting more with the people there than, than, than I did with Malcolm at the time. Like uh, Malcolm was uh, kind of, outgroup in some sense. And I feel like I had suddenly landed already in the in-group and I was like, Oh, what? Super weird. Um, part of that just has to do with like, I didn't have any tangles with them. I didn't have, you know, I wasn't there for uh, five years already. And like, you know, having, there was no buildup of issues, whereas like they had already had that. Um, and so I was kind of the role I had was something like providing space for Malcolm to, learn some things they wanted to learn. Um, you know, since then we have been talking a lot and about all these issues and uh, he's moved out from Waterloo um, in part because his thinking has diverged from theirs. Uh, everyone else is in Waterloo um, and was came to be more in by sort of by happenstance or development more in line with where my thinking was around uh, what's required for trust in relationships and uh, what to do, you know, when you get a bunch of something you don't want from someone, some feedback that you don't like, uh, what do we expect that feedback to even look like? Uh, and how do we find our blind spots um, in that feedback? Um, so the thing that he's, named the non-naive trust dance uh, to bring it back to dancing in some ways is the the new train of thought that I, I basically felt I was already on board with. He just named it. Um, and he's like, he's the one who is uh, being, as I said, more public, more naming the thing. Um, but at the same time, I've been sort of doing my own development of thinking in a way that has just been very similar. Um, and I also managed not to pick up a bunch of bad lessons from Waterloo somehow, uh, which I could have. And he he is currently working with, uh, and uh, describing those dynamics that happened at Waterloo in a way where 
hopefully other people don't pick up the same things. Um, and so now, now he's here in my house and we're going to be doing, we're going to be doing something in, uh, BC, uh, maybe a retreat center, um, maybe something like consulting where we're not quite sure exactly what that's going to look like yet, but that's the new project, the new scene. And, uh, this is also probably why, um, one thing he's been doing is, is tweeting a lot about our conversations and sometimes mentioning me. Hmm. Now you're not him obviously, but you do work closely with him and you're his friend and so on. What, and, and, you know, that relationship is sort of the Genesis for this project that you're embarking on that finds us having this conversation. Yes. Uh, what, if you had to guess, go out on a limb and try to speak for him, <laughs> what, would you guess that he sees in you that he wants to bring mm. out through this project? Oh, that's a mm, great question. <laughs> great question. I mean, you've had a lot of great questions. Uh, I, as a connoisseur of questions myself, I'm like, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> um, what, what does he see in me? One one thing in our dynamic is that he he has a lot he he has a lot of attention a lot of energy a lot of right um, very much so and I'm I'm not quite the opposite but I'm fulfilling a different role of uh con con containing the not really containing the energy um he, he put it a different way he he was like there's so many things to do oh. <sighs> That's a good Malcolm impression. Oh, did you know? Did you know how many things there are to do? Um, and and then he described me as being like, oh, yeah, I could do a thing. I'm, I'm interested in doing things, you know. Um, but like previously, the way I engage with Malcolm is sort of meeting his energy in a certain way. But with my own energy of like, yeah, I could do a thing. Like yeah, yeah, there are a lot of things to do. That's that's right. We could we could do, we could do anything. You know, um, and why that works is like people have often found Malcolm to be too much in a lot of ways. Uh, he's trying to I don't know do too many things. Has too much to say. Has been very loud. Blah blah blah. Um, and I just didn't hold him that way. I'm just like ah, oh, Malcolm's doing Malcolm. You know, he's doing his thing. I don't know why anyone would expect him to do something else. Uh, uh, there's a separate question of like, you know, how does Malcolm want to be in the future, given who Malcolm is now? And like, you know, what does he want to improve on? Um, and, uh, you know, what kind of interactions do I want to have with Malcolm? Uh, th those are all different questions, but they're not, uh, I don't know, fundamentally judgmental or something uh, when it comes to just, th there's a thing that some people to where to the extent that someone's way of being is problematic, they like make them wrong, but problematic for them, make the other person wrong for being that way and tell them not to be that way. Um, and uh, what one attitude I've cultivated is just, just not, 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 not doing that, but just like sort of, that's not even the, the thing. That's not even the frame. It's just, you know, people are going to be people. They're going to, they, they are exactly the way they are. And it seems absurd to expect anything else. Um, so just meeting people where they're at. And uh, not everyone in Waterloo could do that for Malcolm. They couldn't really hold all of that, whereas I can. I'm, I'm pretty good at that. I've, I've had a lot of practice of holding uh, space for, and not even holding, holding space sounds like, you know, like, I'm going to hold space for an hour or something, but like more like holding a general like attitude and container of like just how I approach the thing, how do I approach life, how do I approach relationships that like works really well for Malcolm. And then he gets to be loud about stuff. And if I'm around him, he could be loud about me and what I'm doing. So 
to get back to your question um, of how would how would Malcolm phrase what I, did, what I was doing? Part of, I, I said part of that is is that I'm like yeah, I could do a thing. Um, Another general thing is something around just patience uh, with people that uh, he's found it hard to have sometimes, and that's that's part of what it is to be Malcolm, uh, and that I I am able to be very patient with people in a way that uh, he can't always be, and then I can fulfill like you know in some kind of organization I can fulfill a different role uh, in the interaction. Uh, if people, in fact, need more space and patience and whatnot versus needing to be poked more. Uh, I feel both like that does answer the question and somewhat dissatisfied with it. Uh, I'm I'm glad you're saying that. Yeah. Both, both uh, from two, I'm dissatisfied from two, two angles. One is, um, I think it could be, uh, it, it makes complete sense that you sort of had to like process a lot of things, but I think it could be more concise and like pithy. Uh-huh. Uh, and also, and, and this is the more important thing, is less about what he sees in you or what he finds valuable about you in relationship for him, but what potential he sees in you for yourself and for the world, ah. not necessarily with respect to Malcolm, that, that would make a project like this uh, make sense in Malcolm's mind, if that makes sense. Yeah. So both shorter and and, and more about the future than the past. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, yeah, this sort of answer is definitely a learning edge for me. Um, Uh, so I'll try, I'll try and give another answer. (laughs) Uh, there, there's something like I track a lot of things I'm able to track and keep attention where it should be. Um, and you know, in an organization where lots of people are doing lots of things, you need someone to be able to keep track of what's happening and where where attention should be um and like how people are feeling being present with people um finding it very hard to talk about like how do i fit into an organization though that's Mm. (laughs) hmm interesting Can you ask the question again? Um, what strengths do you think Malcolm sees in you that are present in your relationship with him, but untapped in terms of how you're manifesting them in the world? Ah, good, good rephrase. Um, I guess the, the main thing is just I, I pass his non-naive trust dance test super well. Uh-huh. Uh, like so, so well that like I sort of already was following it before he came up with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like I'm sort of an obvious person to be working with and developing it because I, I seem to just understand it already. Uh, I, I think I understand it. I think he thinks I understand it. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of it just needs to be, you know, explicated still. It's not, there's not a lot of writing or stuff about it, but yeah. And it's like, a you know, I'm just doing this non-judgmental meeting people where they're at thing. Um, 
very consistently and in a way that's especially compatible with him, but also like I've done it with a bunch of other people. So it's not at all, uh, it's not particular to him in another way. Yeah, that, that does bring up the question of um, both for me as the interlocutor in this conversation, but also for anyone that's listening, um, how would you describe what that concept is getting at? Uh, the non-naive trust dance. Yes. As, as opposed to the, the hyper-naive mistrust fight. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also as opposed to the way that Malcolm has articulated that, but how would you describe it? From your yeah. own perspective, yeah. Well, so you know, it has dance in the title. This is very yes. important. My very the important. way I have approached dance has been very much, uh, you know, I'm going to dance with this person. How do I make this dance great? Pretty much, you know, how do I, how do I, how can I contribute to this experience? How can I work with whatever this person is doing? Uh, especially as a very high level dancer, um, I'm often dancing with people who don't have as many skills as I do, but um, you know, there's a way I could approach that where it's like, oh, they don't have these skills. This is boring. This sucks. Um, or it can be like, you know, just how great of a dance can we have? Um, that's part of where I come in and you know, is like already having some of this attitude. Um, the the attitude itself being Having your own way of building trust with people and not externalizing your own sense of whether people are trustable in whatever ways uh, you're concerned about. Um, and so this can be like, you know, do I trust this person to be able to do the spin and dance? Do I trust this person to uh, hold to their word when they say they're going to be here at a certain time? Do I trust them to be able to... Uh, uh, do this project? Do I uh, trust them to tell me something uh, that's important to me when uh, when I want them to, or like you know, to give me feedback about something or to push back? Um, you know, tr trust shows up in all sorts of places, and there has been a lot of externalizing trust um, in society. Whereas, you know, if if some authority figure says something. Uh, we, there, there is a sense of like, we should trust that they're saying what they're saying is true or something. Um, or, you know, your parents are saying something, uh, this person in the community, it has some status and they're saying something and we should trust them or like, you know, they've, they've done certain benchmarks, they have a degree, they have, you know, whatever. Um, or they're like trying to tell you that you should trust them. This is, this is a really common one. The really like, oof, uh, is people trying to tell you how to, that they, um, you should trust them, which is just, that's not how trust works. The trust has to come from the other person based on how they understand the world to work and their expectations of how the person telling them to trust the that they should trust them works and you know their experience with them um so you know in in dance if i'm dancing with a really high level dancer that doesn't mean i'm going to have a great dance or we're going to have you know a good good connection just because they have a bunch of skills um, it allows for a lot of stuff, but I, I've had terrible dances with high-level dancers because we, you know, couldn't get on the same page about well what the song was about or like who's in the spotlight or whatever. Um, and and that'll happen, you know. You just you can't yet figure out how to dance with this person. Um, I've definitely also had you know experiences of I didn't know how to dance with this person, and then I like you know danced with them more and more, and then I learned how to dance with them by dancing with them, um, but also, you know, talking uh, sometimes. So the non-naive trust dance is, you know, it's about trust and building trust as a dance as opposed to, I don't, I don't know, a logical argument or um, there's some kind of right way to do it. That's, that's the other bit. Like, there's there's standards in West Coast Swing, but 
eh, you can dance however you want in, in some sense as well in West Coast Swing. And I think it's the same in life. Hmm. Is it? I'm not 100% sure that I'm fully understanding that. Is it? Is it fair to say that uh, the non-naive trust dance is about how to dance and play and collaborate with people skillfully? Uh, yeah, you could you could say that. Um, that doesn't quite get the core, but that's like that's not wrong. Mm -hmm. What's missing there? Uh, so what you described is kind of like a protocol a little. It, it could be uh, interpreted as a protocol. And the important bit about the non-knife trust dance is it's more like a meta protocol. It's like there are ways to build trust. Mm -hmm. We're not going to tell you what they are. I can tell you like how how what I would trust in particular about someone and how I would know that. Um, but like someone else is a totally different system and like experience in life that gives them different. They have their own tests and like ways of knowing these things. And there's it doesn't make any sense for me to say that like their way of doing it is wrong in some like really deep sense. Um, You know, someone has in, in West Coast Swing, if they've learned to dance a certain way, like I still have to work with that somehow if I'm going to, you know, talk to this person. And I, I can't expect them to just already have learned a different way of dancing if I'm going to talk to them, if I'm going to dance with them. Uh, I, I think that's probably the most important bit about the whole thing. Mm, that's helpful. That's helpful. Yes. Uh Excellent. Excellent. Well, this, there's been so much here in this conversation and I've really enjoyed it quite a bit. And it feels like a beginning for me, a beginning uh, mm. in, in, in this connection, but also for you, uh, maybe uh -huh. a turning point for you. I, I hope it's a turning point for you. And um, I see a lot of a lot being possible for you. So I look forward to seeing how you explore that. And I, I thank you for having this conversation. And really it's been, it's been a privilege to uh, have it with you and to be invited to have it with you. So thank you for that. And, and thank you. Uh, you've done a great job of actually providing space for me to be able to talk. I don't, I don't normally talk this much. Um, I definitely can, as you can see, but mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and you've had great questions as well that you know have been actually exciting. The parts of me that do want to talk, and uh, I too hope that this is some kind of turning point. Mm -hmm. I suspect it will be if you keep having these conversations. Yes. So. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Eric.